The Johns Hopkins Science Review, presented by Johns Hopkins and WAAM in Baltimore, in cooperation with the Dumont Television Network. This is Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, famed for 78 years for its contributions to science and the humanities. Here in its many hospital and university laboratories, Hopkins scientists are constantly probing into the secrets of science, which when discovered will be translated into benefits to be enjoyed by you. Each week, we look over the shoulders of today's scientists and catch a glimpse of the results of their research. On this, our 282nd presentation of the Johns Hopkins Science Review, we watch the work of courtroom doctors. And here to introduce this week's program from Johns Hopkins University is Lynn Poole. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Johns Hopkins Science Review. Now, this week, we would like to demonstrate for you a, one of the newest branches of today's science, and that is forensic medicine, or medicine that deals with the legal aspects of crime. Now, whenever a death occurs that is very sudden and very violent, and a physician cannot give an exact cause for that death, well, it becomes a problem of the office of the chief medical examiner of the state of Maryland. Now, the men who are working in this new field of forensic medicine are men who are trained in legal science and in all phases of medical studies and research. Now, their work is a factual work. Like all scientists, they are seeking facts and seeking them honestly so that they can interpret these facts and bring forth important information that is vital to whatever the study of crime may be. Now, of course, eyewitness accounts are valuable and are used all the time in police studies and in courtroom testimony. But sometimes these uh, eyewitness accounts are not too good. As a matter of fact, I'd like you to watch something for just a minute. Now, what did you see? Let me go back and ask you another question. When I started talking just a moment ago, I had something in my hand. What was it that I had in my hand? Would you be able to identify it, and would you be able to go on a witness stand and swear what this thing was that I was toying with? You probably noticed I had something. Well, it was a p large pair of forceps that I had here. But did you see that before? Well, now, let me ask you again a question without giving you the answers. What happened in the kitchen just a moment ago? Now, you might have been going, driving by that house at night in an automobile and looked through the window. Or you might have been looking through the window as you were walking by. How many people were in the room? What happened? Could you identify these people? Well, now, sometimes you couldn't. Well, now, let's turn to a case. This is a case of a burning house. And it's an interesting story which can best be told by a member of the staff of the medical examiner here in the state of Maryland, Dr. Paul Guerin. This case illustrates the principles used in the identification of burned or mutilated bodies. The story begins at about 11 o'clock one evening when a fire was found burning in a shack. Many hours after the fire was burned out, a body was found in the ashes. This first photograph that we will show you today uh, is a photograph of the ashes uh, where the body was found. You will notice that nearly all of the combustible materials in this house uh, are destroyed. The body was removed to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy and a police investigation was begun. It was soon learned that, the, that an old man lived in this house. Uh, he lived alone and he had last been seen alive at about six o'clock in the evening, uh, at which time he was intoxicated. The man was white and had uh, brown hair. Uh, he stood about six feet, uh, or five feet six inches tall. Uh, down at the, uh, at the morgue where the autopsy was performed, uh, we will look at the next picture, uh, which shows the body. Uh, the clothes are almost uh, completely burned away, and a considerable amount of the soft tissues uh, are also destroyed. The facial features are not recognizable. 
The next picture shows uh, the outside of the head. The soft tissues are completely gone, and there are fractures. Uh, part of the skull has been uh, chipped away. This is the characteristic type of a fracture, uh, which is seen uh, as a result of a burn, and must be differentiated uh, from a fracture that's seen as a result of the blow. We also know that the man who lived uh, in this house had had a fracture uh, many years uh, before, at, uh, a fracture of his arm. And uh, we have uh, also uh, have a, a, uh, an x-ray to show that fracture. But first, let me show you another photograph of his uh, lungs. Uh, this shows the inside of the windpipe and shows some burn material inside the lungs, indicating uh, that the uh, man was alive while the burning uh, took place. Now, this is a, an x-ray of the bones of the arm, and we see a piece of metal uh, in the uh, forearm, and uh, this indicates that uh, it's the site of the repair uh, of the fracture uh, many years before uh, this injury, or, or this fire, rather. Uh, chemical studies uh, which were performed showed a high level of uh, carbon monoxide in the blood and also a high uh, level of alcohol. Thus, the man was definitely intoxicated, and the high level of carbon monoxide shows that it was the direct cause of death in conjunction with the burns, uh, and that the man was living uh, while the burning took place. Uh, a portion of the skin uh, was uh, still preserved on the head, and one could see that the hair was brown. Uh, by measuring the long bones, it was possible to estimate the height of this individual as about approximately five feet, uh, six inches. Uh, thus, a satisfactory uh, identification was made, uh, and a, the possibility of a crime uh, was eliminated. In cases such as this, it is possible to learn a great deal uh, by examining the various bones of the body. I have a series of skulls here, uh, which will illustrate some of these points. It's possible to uh, tell the age of an individual by examining the suture lines of the skull. The suture lines are the lines where the bones of the skull come together and leave a mark. And as the individual ages, these lines close. Uh, this is a, a skull from a young individual showing the suture line uh, very nicely. Here, the suture line is completely uh, gone. This suture line uh, closes at approximately 35 years of age. Other suture, other suture lines uh, close at uh, different ages, and it's possible to estimate the age uh, rather accurately. One can also tell the sex uh, by examining the skull. Uh, the na uh, nasal ridges and the supraorbital ridges are more prominent in the male skull as compared to the female skull, and the nasal angle is more acute in the male skull than it is in the female skull. By examining the bones of the pelvis, we can also uh, determine the sex of an individual. Here I have a male uh, pelvis and here a female pelvis. The sciatic notch in the male pelvis is uh, shows a more acute angle than it does in the female pelvis, and also the pubic angle, as shown here, is more acute than it is in the female pelvis. The outlet of the female pelvis is considerably larger than it is in the male. Uh, I can put my fist through the outlet of this pelvis uh, very readily, uh, whereas the uh, male pelvis uh, does not allow my fist to pass through. By measuring the length of the bones of a body, uh, one can use a formula and uh, compute the height of the individual. This particular bone is the femur, uh, the bone of the upper part of the leg, and by measuring this and using the formula, one can cal uh, calculate the height of the body uh, that it came from. Uh, thus, by utilizing these principles uh, in the medical examiner's office, it is possible uh, to determine the sex uh, and race and the height and to make a very accurate identification of the body, and also to tell whether or not a crime has been committed. A knowledge of anthropology, anatomy, and radiology is important to the profession of forensic medicine. In this case, the medical authorities saved time for the police by proving this death to be accidental. Another segment of forensic medicine deals with the science of chemistry. Sometimes persons die tragically by taking an accidental overdose of barbiturates. 
Sometimes poison is administered with intent to murder. The chemistry of forensic medicine is important and can be outlined best by Dr. Henry Freimuth. Deaths due to poisoning occur fairly often, and most people look upon such deaths as homicidal in nature. This impression has probably been gathered from the writings of popular mystery fiction, but it is far from the truth. Actually, most deaths due to poisoning are either accidental or suicidal in nature. <coughs> However, we must not overlook the fact that homicidal poisoning can and does occur. In the past years in the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland in general, homicidal poisonings have occurred generally in conjunction with suicides. For example, an individual committing suicide with automobile exhaust or by inhaling illuminating gas containing carbon monoxide may cause the death of an another individual. But such a death would not have been an intentional one. But intentional homicide can and does occur. Last year, on the Saturday before Easter, there appeared at one of the local hospitals a 14-year-old boy and his 23-year-old girl cousin. Both stated that they had eaten pancakes cooked by the boy and shortly thereafter became ill and thus came to the hospital. Subsequently, on the next day, the boy died, but the girl eventually recovered. The medical examiner's office was naturally concerned with such a death, and we conducted an investigation to determine the cause. Upon going to the home where the pancakes were cooked, we recovered these three items which you see here. We have a can containing some all-purpose flour. We have a bowl containing some dried pancake batter. And we have a box of pancake flour. I should like to show you some tests which were conducted in this case, which demonstrated the presence of arsenic in all of these items. First of all, I will do what is known as a Reinsch test and take some of this flour and place it in this container right here. To that flour, I will add some hydrochloric acid and then place in that a piece of coiled, clean copper wire. Now that is permitted to stand for some period of time, but since the time required for the reaction is too long for it to be completed here, I have already prepared a positive test to show you what it looks like. Here we have, side by side, two wires. The one on my right is the wire which has been placed in contact with the material containing arsenic, and you can see a black deposit on it as contrasted with a perfectly clean piece of copper wire. Now that indicates the possible presence of arsenic, but to prove it conclusively, we must go further and do other chemical tests. And one of the tests which is used is known as the Gutzeit test. And I have the apparatus here, which is used to perform such a test. In the bottom part of the equipment, there is some zinc, metallic zinc. And to that, we add an acid digest of the material to be tested. Any arsenic in that will be converted to a gas known as arsine, which subsequently passes through here and then over a piece of paper which has been treated with mercuric bromide. As a result of the reaction, we get a brown stain appearing on the paper. And I think you can see that brown stain right there. Now the length of the stain and the intensity of it is proportional to the amount of arsenic present in the material. And I have some standard stains right here, and we can compare those with the test paper and see that in the material tested, we had two micrograms of arsenic. Such tests were conducted in the case which I have just described on all of these materials, and all were found to contain arsenic. In addition, we obtained samples of tissue at the autopsy of the boy and showed the presence of arsenic in his body in amounts sufficient to have caused death, thus conclusively proving that the cause of death was arsenic poisoning, and the investigation showed that it was homicidal in nature. Now, a few moments ago, we gave you a scene in the kitchen and asked if you were the eyewitness to this, would you be willing to go on the stand and swear to exactly what happened in that kitchen? Well, of course, when a scientist goes on the stand, he is swearing his testimony about facts, scientific facts that he has studied and to the best of his scientific ability believes is are true. 
Well, now, another facet of the work of the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner here in the state of Maryland and other states throughout the country is the performance of autopsies on bodies because this is one way that they can determine the cause of death and sometimes identify the body. Now, this is a fascinating part of the story, and we'll turn to another member of the Office of the State Medical Examiner here in Maryland, Dr. William Lovett. In the work of the medical examiners, the cases that come under our jurisdiction are those concerned with violence or death due to obscure or unnatural causes. Throughout the United States, approximately 20% of all deaths need to be investigated by some government agency in order to protect innocent individuals who may be accused of homicide or to uncover the hazards of public health. In addition, the team required for this investigation are those that uh, are composed of the law enforcement agencies as well as the medical profession. In numerous instances, uh, an autopsy is necessary to obtain the facts that are needed for courtroom procedure. The autopsy in many cases is violently opposed by the relatives of the deceased. However, in many cases, the findings at autopsy are directly beneficial to the individuals concerned and to the relatives. For example, I recently investigated the death of an elderly man who was found dead in the locker room of the plant in which he was employed. The information from the relatives indicated that he had had no medical treatment and his death was totally unexpected. The autopsy showed the cause of death to be accidental electrocution and the electrical burns were found on the fingers of the right hand and the ball of the right foot. In investigating the locker room where the death occurred, we found a defective light switch directly above where the body was found and a blown fuse in a nearby fuse box. With this information, the accidental aspect of the death was completely verified and the family was entitled to the accidental insurance benefits that they had been carrying for a long time. Frequently, the investigation uh, into the circumstances and cause of death indicates that there is possibly a second or a third person involved in the death and this individual may be under surveillance by the police. There, the suspicion of the police is oftentimes upheld by autopsy and just as frequently it is uh, completely removed. For instance, there was a young lady found in a hotel room, dead between the bed and the wall. On her head and chest there were numerous bruises which superficially indicated that she had been beaten. However, the autopsy showed that these bruises were three or four days old. The actual cause of death was a hemorrhage inside the head as a result of a rupture of a small blood vessel. Now, these are called congenital aneurysms and they are quite well known to the medical profession. In this chart, we see the location of these aneurysms here in the vessels at the base of the brain. In the lower diagram, there is a large vessel which shows the blowout point that occurs in these so-called congenital aneurysms. Consequently, this young lady's death was entirely due to natural causes, and the suspect was released from uh, questioning, thus benefiting him and clearing up the case entirely. The autopsy, therefore, in these two cases, was beneficial not only to the relatives of the deceased, but to a third party who might have been convicted or attempted to have been convicted of homicide. Another problem of forensic medicine is providing the answer to the questions, did the person shoot himself? Did someone else shoot him innocently by accident? Or did someone shoot with intent to kill? To demonstrate the answers to these questions, we turn to the lecturer in forensic pathology at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, who is also chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland, Dr. Russell S. Fisher. Well, the commonest cause of homicidal death is gunshot wounding. At the same time, serious and not infrequently fatal gunshot wounds are sustained accidentally. Many times, the nature of the wound 
will enable us to estimate the range of fire and therefore help in deciding whether it is accidental or homicidal. To uh, review the situation, let's look at how bullet wounds occur, how they are formed. Uh, here is a diagram which illustrates the sequence of events in gunshot wounding by a bullet. Uh, first, before the bullet has touched the skin, a few thousandths of a second later, as the skin is indented and bent in around the approaching bullet. And as it passes through the skin, cutting off a little piece, the margins of the skin itself wipe against the bullet. They are abraded or uh, torn a little bit, and in addition, any grease on the bullet or powder will be wiped off on the skin. Thus, as we look at a bullet wound, we frequently see the central hole, an area of marginal abrasion and soiling by powder, which tells us with real certainty that this is a bullet wound. Now, if the wound is sustained from close range, that is, from contact, some additional things happen. As the bullet uh, passes under the skin, uh, gases coming out of the muzzle expand within the wound itself beneath the skin and elevate the skin and, in fact, slap it back with great force against the end of the gun if it's pressed tightly to the skin. So at this point, and again here where the margin of the muzzle is hit, and if there's a sight or other metallic portion on the end of the gun where the sight may hit the skin, we're apt to find marks that tell us this is close contact wound. Here is the mark here. Here again, and here, the mark of the sight. Now, let's examine an application of this in a real-life case. A few months ago, uh, we had occasion to investigate the death of a man uh, whose bullet wound you see here. This man, uh, according to his wife, had been shot accidentally uh, when she was putting a gun away that he usually kept under his pillow. Let's examine the wound. According to her, the gun was a few inches from his head, but not in contact. One sees the hole in the center, uh, the underlying fractured skull, because this was on the right side of his head, here is his ear. Uh, the margin of contusion and bruising of the skin surrounding the wound, which is done as the bullet entered, but in addition, a telltale sign some little distance from the wound. This is a contact mark from the end of the sight on the muzzle. It tells us that this woman, in fact, held the gun tightly against her husband's head. You know the rest of what happened. It turned out that she had uh, been angry with him and had purposely shot him because uh, he, she found him asleep and the opportunity arose. Let's consider the same type of evidence in the case of wounding by shotguns. One can fire a gun and produce targets which can be compared with wounds in an individual uh, and a great deal of information may be obtained. And we emphasize that one must fire the same type of gun, the same type of ammunition, because here are two shotgun charges one from a so-called choke barrel, and you notice its diameter is quite narrow, another at the same distance from the muzzle of the gun by the cylinder barrel, which allows the powder to spread in a wider area. But having the gun in question and seeing the wounds, one may be able to reconstruct things, as was done in this case. This individual was found dead uh, at the door of his home in one of the counties near Maryland. There was ample evidence that he had been shot uh, and in fact, an individual uh, who was arrested said, yes, I shot him. Uh, we were tussling. Uh, he grabbed for the gun. Uh, I shot him from three or four feet away. Let's examine his wounds for a moment. Multiple holes where the shot entered, a typical shotgun wound in his arm and another one in the right side of his chest. And the diameter of this powder pattern or this shot pattern is between six and seven inches. Now, in order to show you uh, how uh, this case would be studied, we've asked Sergeant Arthur Plummer, weapons instructor of the Baltimore City Police, to actually fire some targets so that we can see the size holes made. Sergeant Plummer, would you fire one for us from, say, 18 feet, and let's see if this uh, gun makes a target like this. I can see from here that that is far bigger than the six or seven inches. Sergeant, would you come up close and fire one from uh, perhaps three feet, and let's see if the three feet distance that we are told is perhaps right. Well, one sees right away that this is too short. Uh, let's try one, Sergeant, from nine feet and see something about the diameter of that hole. As we look over these and see the uh, powder pattern in the three foot hole, it's obvious that it's quite small, actually measuring two inches in diameter. And uh, from our nine-foot range, 
We have a powder pattern which measures six inches. At 18 feet, it's far larger, measuring 13 inches. And so we are quite sure that the gun shot that killed this man was not fired from three feet, as the story said, nor from 18 feet, uh, but rather from a distance of about nine feet. In reconstructing the total situation, we found that the assailant had simply driven up in his car, parked it about 12 feet from this man's cabin, and then simply fired away when the man stepped out the door. The outcome of the case was that he was shown to be falsifying the facts, and he was subsequently convicted of murder. Thank you, Dr. Fisher, and I think there are two or three very important items that we have to uh, remind ourselves of in this case. And that is that uh, we do have science working arm in arm with the law enforcement authorities. <clears throat> now, we wouldn't want to leave you with the impression that the scientist does all the work. He doesn't at all, because there are the foot patrolmen, there are the detectives, there are the men on the police forces that are doing a tremendous amount of work on all of these cases. And they are working hand in hand with the legal medical authorities in winding up a lot of these cases using science in a brand new way in our day and age. We hope that you've enjoyed this demonstration. We hope that you'll be with us next week when we discuss electricity in medicine. 75 years ago, when Thomas Edison invented the electric light, he had no idea that from his light bulb would grow the great science of electronics. Today, this science is making new and important contributions to the field of medicine and from the development of electronic weapons of war, new techniques for saving human life are being discovered. Next week, we will demonstrate two of the latest applications of electricity in medicine. The Johns Hopkins Science Review is produced by Lynn Poole in association with Robert Fenwick and John Lockwood. The directors are Kennard Calfee and Herbert B. Cahan. Art direction by Barry Mansfield. Film supervision by Gordon Petty. Your narrator, Joel Chasen. The Johns Hopkins Science Review originates through the facilities of WAAM in Baltimore. This is the home of professional football, the Dumont Television Network.